Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Nick Gillespie, and this is The Reason Livestream. Thank you for joining. Uh, we are going to be uh, joined today by Connor Boyack, the president of the Libertas Institute, and Corey DeAngelis, uh, who is uh, up here now. Hello, guys. Can I? Uh, can you both say hello, please? Hello, please. Hey, how's it going? All right. It's good to see you. Uh, they are th most recently the, the co-authors of Mediocrity, 40 Ways That Government Schools Are Failing Today's Students. And we're going to talk about that book and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so um, I guess what I want to do, I'm going to play a couple of uh, slides here that include... Uh, uh, and I just want to, I'm going to ask our... Um, my backstage manager, uh, Best Buyers, if you could make sure that we're recording this correctly. All right. All right. Great. Okay. So um, I want to start with a slide. Uh, this is from A Nation at Risk. Uh, Mediocrity, your new book, um, it starts with, a, you know, it, it's citing a 1983 report that was put together by a, a commission on education excellence, a, a federal panel uh, that um, made this bold statement. And in, in many ways, this uh, a nation at risk kind of started uh, one of the latest kind of, uh, you know, spurts in education reform. Although if we're being honest, education reform has been a constant concern since the colonial period of America. But here we, we have a nation at risk, which jump started a lot of discussion of education reform. In 1983, 40 years ago, if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might have well viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we've allowed this to happen to ourselves. We have even squandered the gains in student achievement made in the wake of the Sputnik challenge. Uh, Sputnik launched in the late 50s. Moreover, we have dismantled essential support systems which help make those gains possible. We have, in effect, been committing an, un, an act of unthinking unilateral education disarmament. Um, Connor, why don't we start with you? What, um, you know, uh, what was the context for a nation at risk and how does that kind of undergird continuing or contemporary interest in, in school reform? Uh, Nick, as you point out, uh, education reform has been a longstanding concern, certainly in the decades preceding this report. There had been in the press in the years prior to the report being issued a large number of you know, op-eds and complaints and people criticizing the poor performance of the education system. And so this group, the National Commission on Excellence in Education, was formed in large part to address those concerns and bring attention to the, the plight of the problem, the pleas of so many who were saying, hey, we got to do something to fix it. They spent 18 months going across the country on basically a listening tour, talking to teachers and administrators and, and students and others, reviewing curriculum and standards. And the report that you uh, just read an excerpt from is uh, the culmination of that 18 month study. They called it an open letter to the American people. And it did use strong language, such as the, the excerpt that you just read, uh, in part to try and galvanize the public into realizing that this was a slow slide into mediocrity, this slowly rising tide, that an actual rising tide often catches people. If it's a rip tide, you know, yeah. swimmers are often unaware um, and uh, it's, you know, then too late for them to, to do anything about it. The purpose of the report was to kind of be the warning sign on the beach to say, right. Hey, be careful. There's a slowly emerging tide here. You should, you know, act accordingly. And this was also, uh, you know, uh, the Department of Education uh, as a cabinet level agency had only been created in the late 70s under Jimmy Carter. Um, and then uh, Ronald Reagan originally ran on on saying he was going to get rid of it, uh, but he kept it. And this nation at risk really helped galvanize his, uh, uh, you know, attempts in the 80s, both under Reagan and then under George H.W. Bush. Um, you know, kind of the need for school reform. Corey, can you talk a little bit about what what were the emphases on school reform or education reform uh, starting in the in the 1980s into the early 90s? 
Yeah, a lot of this was uh, accountability mechanisms and mostly focused on standardized tests. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I want to say is that the the failures have have changed and have become much beyond much further beyond uh, what can be captured by a standardized yeah. test score. And what we're seeing more recently is, and what we highlight in the book is a lot of the non-academic failures of the school mm -hmm. system too, such as them being controlled by the teachers unions and indoctrination that's happening in the schools as well. Uh, and just having a one size fits all system that doesn't, uh, will never meet the individual needs yeah. of families who disagree about how they want their kids raised. And I think that's what we've seen a lot over the past couple of years. And we've seen some pushes from the top down to control the curriculum from one side. And mm -hmm. we've seen um, other reformers such as myself pushing from the bottom up to create more um, uh, of a thousand flowers blooming right. approach, uh, free market approach. Let's talk about that in a second. I want to uh, add, um, oop, let's see if I can get this working here. Okay. So um, I just happened to be, as I was reading your book, I happened to be reading a book called Great Expectations, which is a study of the baby boom uh, generation that was published in 1980. And just as a kind of backdrop, um, this uh, in leading into uh, the uh, a nation at risk, one of the big concerns was that um, test scores had been going down for almost the entirety of the baby boom. So, um, you know, that's part of what, you know, when a nation at risk came out, it was addressing how crappy public schools had gotten or, or education in general. And these are just SAT scores for college bound seniors. Um, in 1963, 68, 73, and 78, so kind of the years before that, and you see declines um, consistently through that. More recently, um, because I want to get to, you know, that's 40 years ago, um, the SAT, of course, uh, and if you either are younger or you have kids of, uh, you know, high school age or whatever, you know that the SAT um, gets changed every once in a while. It gets recentered, and since 2017, uh, the old uh, quantitative and, ver and verbal sections had been supplemented by a critical uh, or rather a writing section. Those have been merged again. And these are the most recent scores which have been going down. But basically what we're looking at, if you take a nation of risk and mediocrity, we're essentially looking at 80 years of kind of uh, collapse. So, um and I guess the other thing that I wanted to just talk about as a, as a kind of stage, uh, as a uh, uh, scene setter, um, is as Corey, you were talking about in the 80s and particular, uh, particularly under people, I think, like uh, William Bennett, uh, Secretary of Education, there was a, 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 a desire for standardized testing to kind of show what was going on. And uh, there seemed also to be an emphasis on the idea of a curriculum that would kind of fit everybody that the that the country should be aspiring to, um, as opposed to this kind of individualized, personalized, um, you know, approach that seems to be more what contemporary school choice advocates are talking about. And I guess, Connor, let me uh, go to you just to uh, ask. You know, in the '90s uh, is when the idea of charter schools. Um, became, you know, a policy priority. Um, and can you talk a little bit about charter schools and how that push kind of reflects a desire less for one type of curriculum that we all know is the best and will work all the time and work for everybody and getting more into kind of dispersing or decentralizing uh, educational curriculum? Well, the, the push for charter schools, as you point out in the 90s, I think uh, is best contextualized as coming on the coattails of the reforms in the 80s with homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Homeschooling was, was effectively illegal in most states mm -hmm. uh, until a lot of court battles throughout the 80s that really sparked a wave of kind of parental rights and educational reform and uh, interest in saying, hey, we need alternatives. There had been a large underground homeschooling uh, movement, of course, but this was kind of brought uh, above board in part uh, with the support of groups like the Homeschool Legal Defense Association mm -hmm. that went and fought and uh, knocked down a lot of these state laws. Leading, leading us to the 90s, as you point out, with the charter school movement, this idea that rather than a one-size-fits-all approach, rather than 
you know, we do it this way in this school and here's the conveyor belt. What if we could create some flexibility within the system? They weren't questioning the system overall. They weren't saying let's no. have education, you know, savings accounts or vouchers or whatever. But hey, could we have schools that look a little bit differently, that operate a little bit differently? Um, I'm ultimately not a big fan of charter schools just because I, mm -hmm. I don't think that they've lived up to the vision of their original proponents. Uh, a lot of times they devolve into kind of lipstick on a pig in the sense that they have superficial differences and, and some marginal differences. But fundamentally, they're all following the same curriculum standards and required to do things largely the same way that happens in the public schools. But you can do you can certainly mm -hmm. see in the early stages of those battles, uh, again, on the coattails of the homeschooling reforms, an increased desire, which now is is substantially larger for parents to say, we need something different because the status quo isn't working. Yeah. Let's um, uh, look at um, a, a slide here. If I, I apologize for my technical uh, difficulties. Um, what the... Here we go. Okay, so uh, just to uh, kind of uh, talk a little bit more about Backdrop as well, uh, Corey, this is a piece that you wrote in 2020. Inflation-adjusted K-12 through education spending per student has increased by 280% since 1960. Um, you know, so uh, on average, the U.S. spends over 15 grand a year per student. Um, where has that money gone? Because that, you know, and this is inflation adjusted. So it's, you know, it's not simply because everything is more expensive than in 1960. What are, what are the main components of per pupil spending? Yeah, look, and that is from June of 2020. Um, so the, the spending is a lot higher now, even than it was mm -hmm. in 2020 because of all the so-called COVID relief I think uh, we pumped $190 billion in, in so-called COVID relief into the K-12 school system since March of 2020, which is over three or $4,000 per student. So we spend a lot more now than we did then. And even then, if you just look between 1970 and um, 2019, with the latest federal data that we have nationwide, uh, per student, we've increased per, st per student education expenditures by uh, 150 two percent over that period and teacher salaries since 1970 have increased only by about eight percent so it's not going towards mm -hmm. the teachers in the classroom it's going more towards staffing surges and administrative blow if you look at a report by mm -hmm. ben scaffity uh, back to the staffing surge he looks at different periods of time finding that uh, the the number of support staff in particular Re, re, raises exponentially in, in different locations where student enrollment and teachers in this in the buildings is pretty stagnant. And I think that's because the current school system is a one size fits all monopoly that has no incentive to spend additional dollars wisely. So they put it towards more people because more employees means more dues paying members for the, the teachers yep. unions, which means more money for people like Randy Weingarten who make over $500,000 a year. So and even, even uh, but it's not even going to teachers. It's going to staff who then end up joining unions. That's right. And if you look between, uh, I've, I've took, there's a, been an image that goes around on Twitter pretty, pretty uh, often that I was the first one to create it. I didn't put my name on it. Mm -hmm. I probably should have. But it's a graph between 2000 and 2019 using federal uh, data sources, finding that the number of students in the system increased by about 7%. The number of teachers in the system, similar, about yeah. 7 or 8%. But then the number of administrative staff increased by about 80%. So mm -hmm. looking at different periods, we find the same. Uh, the, what are, the what same are those trends. people doing? What are, what are the support staff? What are the non-instructional staff doing? Well, they uh, a whole host of different things. Um, so in Los Angeles, for example... Uh, since 2019, they had a, a plan to of what to do with the additional 69% of spending that was going into the Los Angeles public schools. And the latest uh, report that I saw showed a, a, an increase of counselors by about uh, 80% mm -hmm. and, and a, an increase in, in teaching staff by a much lower, lower number, mm -hmm. while student enrollment over the same period 
was projected to, to decrease by about 6%. So in what other industry do you lose your customers, lose 6% of your customers, and then start hiring more and more people with Los Angeles Public Schools now spending um, in the latest budget, I believe over $25,000 per student. So they're just a whole host of different, you know, they're, they're yep. trying to make the schools um, and they can, they can, they can lay out arguments as to why it might be a good idea to have more counselors because while well, we closed the schools and we hurt the kids mentally. So now we mm -hmm. got to fix the problems that we created by hiring more counselors. Yeah. And so they just, um, yeah, they'll, they'll throw everything at the wall, see what sticks and, and hire as many people as they can in any position. Um, Nick, if and, we, yeah, go ahead. Connor. I was just going to add briefly and tie us back to your uh, slide with the SAT scores. What's especially compelling about the data that Corey is describing is that if you look at the test scores across the same period of time, whatever chunks of, of time you want to look at, the test scores are flat. Now, mm -hmm. Corey and I, you know, are, are, we don't believe that standardized testing is the, you know, summum bonum of educational attainment, but right. it is an effective way to try and at least assess lightly uh, what the performance looks like. And test scores have not gone up. So the, yeah. the increases in investment in the administrative class of these schools may have its perks, may have its uh, stated purposes, but it's not trickling down to improving the education of the students. And that, I think, is what's most compelling about the problem is that uh, we're, we're chasing, uh, you know, putting bad money into a system that isn't ultimately serving the ideal uh, customer for which it purportedly exists. And so we right. say... We say in the book, ultimately, that why do schools exist now? It's not to educate students. It's a, a jobs program for adults. And right. the unions defending that is, is ultimately its core value proposition at this point. So let me uh, throw up a, another slide here because, I, you know, this is to me, I mean, one of you know the most stunning cases for school reform is simply whether it's 1960 or 1970, you know, ha wherever you want to start the clock running expenses per student are way, way up. And test scores, as you're saying, they're flat, in some cases, slightly declining, in some cases, slightly up. And regardless of whether, you know, we think, oh, the, the only thing that matters is how people do on standardized tests. Um, you know, that's like, it's, it's clearly like, unless we just want to say kids are dumber now, there's something wrong when you're spending so much more money to get the same result you got, you know, 20 or 50 years ago or 60 years ago. And yet, and I guess this moves into our, our next phase, when you look at parental satisfaction um, of schools, this is kind of mind boggling to me. And I'm wondering, um, you know, if you guys could comment on this a little bit. This is satisfaction rates um, for, you know, if you have a kid attending school, whether you're very satisfied, satisfied, dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. And, and this charts, you know, private school parents, Choice district parents, so that's people who are in a, a district that offers choice, whether or not you uh, uh, take advantage of it. Assigned district school parents, so that's people whose kids just go to traditional residential assignment schools, wherever the district says your kid's going here, you go with that. Or charter school parents who have some. And what's amazing is when you look at the red numbers, there's not as much variance as you would expect, right? Like wouldn't, I? and I guess, my question for you and um, uh, Corey, why don't you start? You know, why aren't if schools are spending so much money and doing such a mediocre job, why aren't parents, you know, burning down the schools? <laughs> well, this doesn't capture all of the uh, parents who are pushing back at the school board meetings yep. who are dissatisfied with their schools. So, um, yeah, this is one of the polls, but there's also another one from, uh, I believe, Pew Research finding that support among the public school system among Republicans is at an all time low. I believe right. it was Pew Research. So, you know, there's other polls, but, you know, who, what are you, you going to believe this, uh, this graphic or, or my lying eyes? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. People I are mean, pushing but, uh, back and yeah. I, I think things have changed over time as okay. well, especially more recently with the school closures mm -hmm. and parents getting to see another dimension of school quality. That's more important than test scores. Like a lot of families might've had their kids in a rated schools and thought, Hey, my school's yeah. good. There's nothing, there's not a problem with my kid's school, but now that they've seen something else going on where, mm -hmm. well, maybe they're, they're not just focusing on academics. They're focusing on these other things that I disagree right. with. And I think that's also why we've seen a more recent surge in support for school choice because families started to see that school quality is multidimensional mm -hmm. and their kids are not being ra raised in ways that are aligned with their values.
Yeah, I mean, I know, uh, uh, Corey, you and I have talked about this at various points over the years that, you know, the COVID experience, if if the Vietnam War was the living room war because it was the first war that, you know, was shown on in people's television, you know, in, in their family rooms, their living rooms, like it was in the house. COVID was somewhat analogous in that people, parents started to see what their kids were actually learning during the day, uh, you know, because of Zoom classes and things like that, which were, you know, clearly a catastrophe for everybody on every level involved. And, you know, there's no question that poor uh, or low income uh, students in low income households suffered worse. But if, you know, nobody was happy with that. And it's kind of like, if this is what I'm paying for, I'm, I'm going to be kind of pissed. And, and one other thing, there's a lot of polls that we've shown over time, even before COVID and the closures, mm. uh, and EdChoice does a lot of these, and I, I know there's other groups that do the, these polls as well, but nationwide, just asking a different question, where do you send your kid and where would you send your kid if money weren't an issue? Mm -hmm. And overwhelmingly, those polls typically find that, again, you know, 90% of kids are in public schools, but if they had a real choice to make it more economically feasible to ha send them yeah. to a private or religious or charter or, or homeschool option, only about half of that amount respond that they would still have their kid in the public school. So I think that's more yeah. of a revealing statistic. Um, Connor, uh, to, uh, you had mentioned earlier that, um, let me, uh, uh, sorry about this, uh, doing a, uh, Sorry, I am uh, not as uh, technically adept as I uh, once <laughs> thought I was. Bess, uh, if you could. Uh... Hmm. Oh, we don't want that. I want to uh, bring Connor into the uh, main frame. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Connor, you, you suggested, I mean, you're not enamored of charter schools because they're essentially a version of uh, public schools. I mean, they're, you know, lipstick on a pig. Um, in many ways, private schools are like that as well. I mean, that, or, you know, that they, I mean, most schools tend to do something similar, um, you know, and they do it better or worse. And that's partly dependent on the, the facility. It's partly dependent on the faculty of a school. It's also partly dependent on the, the family of the kids who are going. Um, a lot of educational achievement attracts with parental education levels and, and socioeconomic status and things like that. Um, just as a, that's a backdrop to the question of, um, you know, what, what does, what is education for? What is K through 12 education for in your model? Um, what, you know, because I think part of, uh, when I think about school reform and about the impediments to it, um, part of it is that we assume that what, what education is for is to create kids who know a lot and are good thinkers and are critical thinkers and know a bit about the past, uh, something about the future, and then have the skills to kind of create learning going forward. But what if, you know, from a, a kind of quasi public choice, libertarian or mm -hmm. Marxist angle, what if the function of education, is, it really has very little to do with, you know, giving your kids, you know, skills or knowledge, and it's more to just kind of replicate or continue the status quo. Um, you know, can you speak to that and then kind of lay out what what is your vision of what K through 12 education should be aspiring to do? Sure. It's a provocative uh, set of questions. Um, I, I think the answers depend on on the context. So do we want to look at this through the lens of the architects of the mm -hmm. modern public edu uh, education system? What their purposes and intent were? Mm -hmm. Were they really trying to create critical thinkers, independent minded, rugged individualists who, you know, in a Ayn Rand fashion, uh, had self ownership and, and could right. rationally think and build a, a, a freer future. Well, no, uh, quite the opposite. When you look at Horace Mann and John Dewey and all these guys, these were secular humanist socialists. They were collectivist fundamentally. They literally talked openly and frequently about how uh, they wanted to socially engineer the rising generation to better conform to their vision of the future. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when we hear parents saying, oh, the school system's broken, we say, well, is it? Because if you go back <laughs> right. to its early architects, a lot of what we see today. And is, there's kind uh, of a right wing version of that too, right? And the, uh, you know, and I'm thinking my, my parents were born in the twenties. They were the children of immigrants. So they needed to be Americanized. 
Sure. And they were, you know, they, one of yeah, one of them went to a Catholic school during the Depression in New York. The other went to a public school. They weren't being taught to be independent thinkers. They were being taught on some level to be good Americans. And that meant, you know, they could say the Pledge of Allegiance, but also that they would be good workers, that they would yep. show up and follow orders and be more or less productive. Right. So there's a kind of National Association of Manufacturers version of what education is for as well there very much is there's this yeah. kind of uh economic overlay over the system where for a century plus it's been perceived that it, it's a, a feeding system a feeder into uh, the economy which is why what we call today public schools Corey and i use the term government schools yeah. in the book because we think that's more accurate but they used to be called factory schools for a long time, they were literally called factory schools. Why? They were training kids to sit at a desk, follow orders, do their little task, be a cog in a machine, raise their hand if they yep. needed to go to the bathroom. And it was widely perceived in a very positive way yep. that this was going to help prepare kids for having good jobs. We see this today, even though we have a totally different economy, though we have the same education system from a century ago yep. that was uh, for a different economy. But we see it today with things like Common Core and no Child mm -hmm. Left Behind and other uh, emphases that are focusing on what are called college and career readiness. Mm -hmm. So the purported purpose today of the K-12 system is to basically prepare children for higher education and for, mm -hmm. uh, for the economy. What's fascinating, I unfortunately <laughs> don't recall off the top of my head uh, who, who did the poll. We cite it in the book. But just a, a few months ago, this huge poll uh, came out. <laughs> And they did a really interesting, uh, uh, had an interesting methodology. They were asking parents their own perspective of how they prioritize K to 12 education. In other words, why do you think K to 12 education is important for your child? But then they also asked them how they perceive others uh, rank that type of perception. So college and career readiness, right? Parents for their own children prioritize that very low on the spectrum of priorities. They, they de-emphasize that. They didn't think it was that important. However, when they were asked what they perceive society and their peers prioritize it, it was very high because everyone thinks that that's why we educate kids. That's why we put them through all the misery of you know, all these years of schooling is so that they'll have a good job, is so that they'll be prepared for the future. What ranked at the top for parents? Uh, two things, practical skill development. Not these abstract ideas of, you know, getting you ready for a future career, but very practical skills, financial management, and everything else. And number two is critical thinking. Hmm. And uh, and if you were to assess the modern education system based on those things, I think it ranks very poorly. Uh, your final question. Yeah. About, so what, yeah, what, what for you, what, what is the vision <laughs> of, you know, what, what is, what is, uh, you know, education for? In two minutes or less. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, you know, the root word uh, of education, when you look at the etymology, it is to draw out. Uh, the modern school system is trying to fill in, cram kids mm -hmm. full of knowledge just in case they ever need it 30 years from now and need to remember that the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think by contrast, true education is trying to draw out. It is a Socratic method. It is trying to challenge uh, kids and adults to mm -hmm. think critically about their own ideas, to identify where they can find that information from. So I think what we ultimately need is educational entrepreneurship. It's why I'm so bullish on micro schools, because what you're finding is a lot of teachers who are fed up with the bureaucracy, they make way more money and have total freedom starting their own school. And then they can cobble together curriculum and activities and projects from a variety of sources. My own kids go to an Acton Academy. I'm a huge fan of Acton Academies. They're all over the country. Can you kind explain of a, what that is? Yeah, yeah. They're kind of a Montessori-like private school. Uh, typically, they're micro schools. These are small schools, but they're very Socratic in nature. It's project-based learning. It's self-guided. Mm -hmm. the, there are no teachers. The kids are in charge of their own education. The adults are what are called guides. So they're there to help when needed. But they provide all these resources to kids. They provide them the time and the educational freedom to follow their curiosities and figure out what they want to do. Mm -hmm. They have a peer community there to kind of debate and challenge ideas and work together on projects. And it provides the children not only a lot more self-ownership uh, to direct their own education, but the freedom to do so. Uh, the, the biggest thing that we stifle for kids that was stifled for me as a graduate of what I call the public fool system was uh, that I had no education freedom. I, I would be curious about things. I would raise my hand. Hey, why, you know, why are we learning this? Oh, put your hand down. It'll be on the test. 
Um, so fundamentally, Corey mentioned this earlier, it's a pseudo monopoly. Fundamentally, what I believe the school system needs is competition. We know that that's how things improve and prices go down. Um, I'm not so, uh, I'm not a central planner. I'm not going to say we should re-architect all <laughs> yeah. of K-12 education based on this. I think though, systematically, what we need is to introduce competition to the system and unleash education entrepreneurship to find a diversity of approaches and curricula and options that can best resonate with each unique individual experience. We don't really have that. We have a small amount, right. but with all these states passing education savings accounts and other reforms, I think I'm increasingly hopeful about the future that we're going to have more of a market place of educational uh, approaches to to uh, help kids in the future i you know one of the things as you were talking um it was fascinating to me you know we we talk about horseshoe theory uh, you know on the right and the <laughs> left of how extremes come together in a way many of the the kind of pedagogical uh you know kind of orientation that you were talking about reminded me of paola Freira, the uh you know the the marxist brazilian uh, kind of bet noir of a lot of right wing conservatives because he opposed what he called the banking theory of education that, you know, you put kids in a classroom and then you fill them with information. You're depositing knowledge and whatnot. And his whole idea from a hard left position was that now we need to be creating kids who are critical thinkers who will interrogate the, the structures of the society that uh, of which they're a part. Um, that's kind of fascinating. I guess, Corey, does um you know how does this the version of things that you guys are talking about is radically dispersed radically decentralized highly individualized how does that play uh, among kind of right-wing school reformers who oftentimes seem to be talking about we know you know there is this one best way to teach things and we know what that is and we need to kind of be pushing that through the system yeah, I mean, we've seen two different types of reforms being pushed to fix the curriculum disagreements in the government school system. And, and one has been from the top down to ban CRT, for example, or other concepts that are uh, divisive concepts, mm -hmm. which one doesn't actually work because it's a, basically a form of playing whack-a-mole where you're trying to hit the mole and then the mole doesn't actually go down. It doesn't work. It's mm -hmm. unenforceable. We have videos from all of these states, from Texas, from Idaho, from Tennessee, from Iowa, uh, and, and others where you have undercover journalists going there from accuracy and media and getting the public school officials to admit that, yeah, we banned it here, but we'd still do it. We just call it social emotional mm -hmm. learning or we call it student mental health. So they just move the goalposts and it's totally unenforceable uh, for the most part. And the better solution, in, in my view, is from the bottom up with school choice. It's like if, if you're just not going to listen to what the law says anyway, and if it's really hard to – if we can't even agree on what critical race mm -hmm. theory even means, and it, it may means different things to different yeah. parents, um, they, parents know like the specific things that they want and what they do not want taught. And the, the better way is to just give the money to the parents in the form of an education savings account and let them choose mm -hmm. the school that best aligns with their values. I think this is the only way forward through freedom as opposed to force so that families can choose the schools that that align with their values and meet their needs in other ways. The whole government mm -hmm. school system is inherently in conflict with our view of what education should look like, which is parents raising kids in ways that that they want to. You can't do that no. with a one size fits all government school monopoly. It is by definition never going to work. You're always going to have one group of parents forcing their views on another group of parents. It's typically a majority or in some cases a special interest minority inflicting mm -hmm. their views on other groups. And that is a problem and the only way out is is through allowing parents to choose and and things no. like what connor was talking about with micro schools might be one of the best ways i i find i mean i find that vision uh, sadly my kids are already uh my younger son is about to graduate college so it's it's all too late for him but i find that vision that you guys are, are kind of articulating of, of a radical uh dispersion of power and of money and of uh you know allowing a thousand flowers to bloom in terms of curriculum uh, just, you know, really bracing and exciting. Um, let's talk, uh, if we can have that slide back up, Bess. Thank you. Um, you know, one of, uh, so, uh, you know, Connor, I'm curious, how do you, you your book, uh, you have a blurb from Chris Rufo, the Manhattan Institute uh, uh, scholar who has really 
kind of push the uh, the demonization of critical race theory and a variety of other kinds of uh, left wing educational you know priorities that he says are throughout the K through 12 system. He also we've talked to him on Reason and elsewhere. Also says he's a fan of uh, school choice. When we, and he's tight with uh, Ron DeSantis. Uh, he was at the signing of uh, one, uh, at least one of the uh, kind of education reform bills that uh, DeSantis did. DeSantis, the governor of Florida, leading you know candidate possibly for the Republican nomination for president, is a kind of fascinating case study. Florida has a robust school choice program that he has been adding to. It existed before him, but he has added it. But he's also going hammer and tong after certain specific aspects, not just of the K through 12 education, but has also tried to do that at the um, at the college and or post secondary level. How do you how do you feel about somebody like a DeSantis? Something similar, I guess, is going on in a place like uh, Texas uh, with Greg Abbott, where Texas, you know, oddly has not been a leader in school choice despite you know being a conservative state. But, you know, what do you make of somebody like a DeSantis? Is, is this, um, you know, is this just an internal contradiction that will have to explode? Or, you know, what, what, do you, what do you have to say about somebody like a DeSantis? I think that the example Corey used earlier of political whack-a-mole is instructive here, right? When you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you're a big, you know, mallet, everything looks like a mole in, in a, a whack-a-mole game. And someone like DeSantis, who is seeking higher office and trying to uh, illustrate his kind of distinctions from Trump and other candidates on the, the field, uh, is leaning into this moment when, as Corey pointed out, a lot of these parents are upset. They're going to school board meetings. They're trying to to fight back. So I think it's politically strategic on his part to be kind of the tip of the spear in yeah. fighting some of this through the political process where others are just trying to show up to school board meetings and pressure elected officials. He is one and he has a bully pulpit and he can do something about it. Um, you know, Chris has done yeoman's work uh, with CRT and other issues, trying to mm -hmm. raise the warning voice, trying to make clear that these are problems. Fundamentally, that's the purpose of the book that Corey and I have out is to be a warning voice and say, here's all these problems happening. But at the end of the day, uh, what DeSantis is doing and other efforts like this through the political process to uh, to restrict teachers, to modify curriculum, mm -hmm. to tie the hands of local educators and the teachers unions, uh, number one, it's only going to go so far. As Corey pointed out, they're going to wiggle around it and find a way around it. So it looks good superficially for DeSantis to enact these controls or others like him. But when the rubber meets the road, are we really having the substantive changes that were you know, purported to happen when the law was passed or the executive order mm -hmm. was signed? Fundamentally, I think of uh, the Henry David Thoreau quote that there are for every thousand hacking at the uh, at the branches, there's only one striking at the root. And we've been here before. We've been here with Common Core. We've been here with social emotional learning. We've been here with critical race theory. And now all this, you know, gender wars and many other things in the decades mm -hmm. preceding the examples I listed. And where has that gotten us? Where have the substantive reforms been? Nothing is going to happen until we strike the root. The root, as I perceive it, and I think Corey agrees, is the monopoly, is the guaranteed uh, consumer pipeline to the government school system. And until we introduce substantial competitive forces to uh, induce enough market pressure on these institutions to reform, none of these topical, marginal uh, mm -hmm. efforts are going to have substantive change. They might make us feel good in the moment. We'll all applaud at a press conference yeah. when the new reform is announced. But you know, months later, when the dust settles and people's attention moves on to the next topic and everyone forgets about it, all the people who are still there, all the teachers union members, all the administrators are going to be continuing to do what they want to do. And, uh, and we're just going to further slide into mediocrity. So we fundamentally need competition. And that's why the school choice movement, I think, is exploding is because so many parents, as you point out, Nick, with Zoom school and uh, during COVID, so many more parents have an appetite now for alternatives. Well, what? And the yeah, go ahead. The Carson. teachers union knows that school choice is the bigger threat to their monopoly than these top down reforms. If, if you look at some elections, for example, in, in Georgia, uh, it was an interesting general election for their superintendent. The, the Republican was against CRT and, and was for CRT bans, but was against school choice. And the Democrat was actually for 
uh, school choice. Um, and so mm -hmm. the teachers union uh, did, did not endorse the Democrat in that race. I believe they endorsed the Republican right. instead, despite his opposition to CRT. And that just goes to show you they're more afraid yeah of bottom-up reform because that, that actually threatens their power. So um, you guys are both proponents of educational savings or education savings accounts, which would divert a fair amount of, uh, not all, but a fair amount of school funding, typically at the state level, to directly to parents to use kind of however they see fit uh, in order to increase the education or, or direct the education of their kids. Arizona is really kind of blazing a trail there as well as a couple of other places. Let me ask for, you know, if we're talking about, you know, giving parents $7,000, $9,000, $10,000, you know, not, not the full average amount of per pupil spending, but a, a, essentially a voucher to uh, use towards whatever kind of educational experiences you want to pay for, for your kids. And Connor, why don't you go first? What are the limits on that? Um, you know, if it's tax funded money, it's going, you know, it is going directly to the parents. So in that sense, it's like a Pell Grant. And I don't think we need to worry or get into questions of whether or not send it, using that to send your kid to a religious school is a problem. It shouldn't be any more than it is to use a Pell Grant to go to a religious college. But are there limits on what we should, uh, you know, we should expect tax dollars to fund? when it comes to education for K through 12 students? Uh, so I run a think tank in Utah, Libertas Institute. And 15 years ago in, uh, in Utah, we were leaders in the school choice movement in passing mm -hmm. a innovative voucher law uh, into place. It would give uh, each child, each student about three to $4,000. Uh, but as with a, a typical voucher program, that money would entirely go to a private school of the family's choosing. So the, the funding was flowing directly to the institution, creating a nexus for uh, potential and likely regulation. So I, I was never really a fan of the, the voucher model. Uh, of course, the teachers unions were far less of a fan. Right. They, the NEA invested $2 million to overturn that Utah law because they saw that this would kind of trickle down and go elsewhere. They were successful in overturning it. Mm -hmm. And so until this year, when we passed a universal ESA program in Utah, there hadn't really been school choice because everyone was terrified of the teachers unions until this post COVID moment where, you know, par parental interest in choice has, um, has skyrocketed. And so I think this is kind of the moment that we're in where the political landscape is changing. And so many more people are demanding uh, reforms, which is why you see a lot uh, more ESAs passing. And I think it mm -hmm. is structurally a better model for the reason you're asking in that the money is going to the family and they could spend a little bit on Amazon, a little bit on the museum mm -hmm. for a field trip, a little bit on, you know, Tuttle Twins books, for example, yeah, which right. a lot of families do. And, and what you see is a, a kind of a, a, a decentralization of the finances which means that that regulatory nexus, that the, the temptation for bureaucrats to attach the strings is severely weakened. I'm not going to say it's eliminated because, you know, enterprising bureaucrats do what they do. But um, as we were working on our in Utah, really putting in a lot of intentional language to tie the hands of bureaucrats to really impede their ability to step in and try to right. regulate it. It's but is it, I mean, please. I guess my, one of my questions is, you know, uh, on food stamps or on SNAP benefits, you know, you can buy, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, you, you know, you, you can't buy cigarettes and whiskey, yeah. right? With, with SNAP benefits, um, you can't buy certain types of food, certain types of candy and things like that. Is there, are, are there limits? I guess what I'm asking is like in an ESA, um, you know, uh, should, uh, you know, you can send, you can spend the money on Amazon books, but not on all books or like, and, and I'm not asking, I, I guess what I'm asking is conceptually, not politically, are sure. there limits? Like, how do we, yeah. you know, how do we know that this isn't just going to the parents car or something? Like yeah. That? that Okay. That's a great question. And I'm, I'm glad you gave it a little bit more focus. So this yeah. is going to depend state to state and how they structure their laws. But the answer is, is yes, there are limits. And typically what states are doing, what we did in Utah is there will be a select uh, range of pre-approved materials, courses, programs, curriculum, and so forth that the administrators have pre-vetted. And so that makes it easy. Yeah. But then you can also then request one-off approvals and say, 
hey, we're interested in doing this. We just need someone to acknowledge that that works. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, this treats these expenses more as an auditable thing rather than a regulatory right. thing in the sense that you're not going to have regulators. Like with food stamps, no one steps yeah. in and says, I'm going to tell you how to raise your children now that you're you know, getting food stamps. If anything, it's just a simple audit process to see if the expenses mm -hmm. were authorized or not. And so most states have a predetermined set of uh, expenses that are qualified in the statute to give guidance then to the regulators and administrators to say anything falling under this umbrella. And most of those umbrellas are fairly broad. So right. yes, it could be books on Amazon as long as you can substantiate that there's an educational benefit for the students using them. Uh, the devil's in the details, but most programs yeah. that I've seen and certainly ours in Utah is written broadly enough that parents will be able to fairly easily justify things that actually have an educational benefit right. for their and, and the, the default, movies, you know, not going to yeah. work. But well, or maybe right. I mean, or, but the the, the yeah, default perhaps. setting is the default setting is you know uh, you know the parents unless something really raises a red flag, we're not going to worry about it. It strikes me and I, a fundamental difference with a Section five twenty nine plan, which is the you know tax advantage savings for college. But you can pretty much spend your Section five twenty nine money on anything related to your kid. You might get audited, but it's kind of loose that way. Um, obviously it's different because it's your money, although, you know, you get a tax break on it, but, um, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I guess part of it is the politics of selling school choice. Um, you know, who, who are the main constituents? I mean, there is, there's a reformer class and you guys are exemplars of this. Um, there, you know, but then who else, what, what kinds of parents are, calling for a radical choice uh, agenda. Connor, I mean, why don't you or Yeah, uh, Corey, I'll why don't you to Corey. Corey, it's, go ahead. Okay. It's yeah. all, I mean, it's all sorts of parents. You have uh, homeschoolers who might want to use this for homeschooling expenses right. uh, or micro schoolers. It could be families uh, who want to send their kids to private school to pay for tuition right. and fees. It could be families who are in uh, failing government schools. I mean, you, you look at a lot of the up and the, the programs that have been running for years and the average income of the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship Program, for example, uh, before they expanded it uh, this this past year, was about $40,000 uh, per household in D.C., uh, where I'm actually at right now in, in a hotel. But um, their voucher program that started in, I want to say, 2003 or 2005, their average household income for that program right. was about uh, $30,000 per, per household. And... Uh, so these are low so, income they, so uh, they have who are highly motivated. Uh, a but lot what of them have special needs families too. Uh, what them, about religious? I mean, religious people are definitely interested in this a lot, right? Because they often have most the most beef with uh, kind of public school agenda. What about in the suburbs? Because, you know, a plurality of Americans live in suburban settings. Um you know, school districts, and I mean, this is spurious, but it's deeply, deeply held that the quality of your schools uh, reflect very much in the value of your house. Um, and you move to a, uh, you know, if you have kids, you move to a town with good schools, which generally means it's a little bit more, you know, a higher income. Um, or if you don't have kids, and most people don't have kids, right? Most households don't have K through 12 students. Uh, they don't want to do anything that's going to mess up the property values, right? Um, how do you how do you address that? And you know how do, how do you activate people like that? Well, if you like your public school, you can keep your public school, right. unlike with your doctor. It's it's actually yeah, yeah. true. And with when school choice is expanded, the public schools, if anything, get better because of competition. So right, the, and there the is enemies... actually a lot of research to sh suggest yes. that. I mean, going back decades that whether it's Catholic schools or charter schools or whatever, the, you know, when there's more types of schools, the public schools actually, the traditional public schools up their game. But Yeah, it's a rising tide that lifts all boats. 26 to 29 of the studies on the topic mm -hmm. are, are positive. So overwhelmingly positive evidence on that. So school choice doesn't destroy the public schools. It makes them better. And in fact, during the pandemic period, Michael Hartney and Leslie Finger did a study that's peer reviewed now finding that in places that had more Catholic schools nearby, which were open over the pandemic for the most right. part, um, the public schools were more likely to open too in person. So that hmm. suggested a competitive yeah. effect too, even during uh, the COVID era, even when it just came to 
whether you opened your opened your school or not. Mm -hmm. um, so this is why defenders of the status quo, the teachers unions, they try to label people like Connor and I as 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 those who want to destroy the public school system mm -hmm. because they know some people they like their public schools. Um, but a lot of those people who did like their public schools pre pandemic who thought that they ha they bought themselves into a fantastic mm -hmm. public school district because of the rating by the state started to see there's something else going on here too. So um, that story has Nick, changed a little bit. Yeah. Nick, Connor. let me add a quick exclamation point on that. So going back to the polling data you shared about the high satisfaction rate that mm -hmm. parents have, um, I think, you know, tying that to what Corey is saying, uh, my, my perspective is that the existing system is being destroyed that we are dumbing down our education, that we are mm -hmm. sliding as a society into intellectual mediocrity. All the while, parents are quote unquote satisfied. It's kind of like the frog in the, the proverbial pot mm -hmm. of boiling water, right? So many of these families, I would argue, don't realize the depth and the breadth of the problem. Mm -hmm. They think, well, I went to public school, I turned out fine. So, yeah. you know, I like my kids' teachers and the football team is great. What does it mean to be mm -hmm. satisfied, right? Uh, so when you ask, as Corey pointed out, when you ask the question a different way and when you, you know, do things yeah. differently, you get different results. But I do feel like the ardent defenders of the status quo are the ones actually trying to protect the subtle and slow destruction of the education system. And so they malign people like Corey and I who are out there trying to push some competition against them and improve the quality. They claim that we're the ones destroying it when fundamentally we're actually trying to increase and improve educational attainment recognizing that the status quo is is quite the opposite and one more uh, thing on that on that chart is that yes. people don't like to admit that they're sending their kid to an institution that is failing their child uh, for 13 years so if yeah. you give everybody options even if they don't have them today if you provide that option in the form of an education savings account i feel like those numbers would change as well we're, we're looking at uh, kind of a static model as opposed to a dynamic model if there was true choice then people uh, would be more likely to, to say that may, maybe I want that choice too. Um, I want to introduce a uh, quote from Robert Pondicio, who's at uh, AEI, as he wrote this for the uh, uh, Fordham Institute, uh, but it's provocative and I want to get your, uh, your reaction to this. Uh, Pondicio, who we had a uh, uh, back during School Choice Week, Zach Weisbuehler mm -hmm. and I talked to him for a lively hour. One of his critiques, and he's taught he taught in the South Bronx in a, in a low income, uh, educationally uh, challenged uh, school. And one of his big things is that, you know, we're not teaching basic reading and everything kind of flows from that. He's both an advocate, an absolute advocate of school choice, but also believes in certain kind of core pedagogical conceits as well. But he writes, there is an idea, especially prevalent among libertarians and some conservatives, that school choice is the answer to the problems of social justice activism and political indoctrination in schools because it allows parents to pull their children out of schools where woke ideology has infused the curriculum and school culture. The idea is not just wrong or simplistic, it's mm -hmm. dangerous. Um, my question, because you've touched on this about how, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, the attempts of some of this stuff are is whack-a-mole, but I guess my question uh, for you guys is um, the issue of um, kind of community. One of the things that seems to be, you know, a, a front and center concern in contemporary America is the idea that um, for a variety of reasons, and some people paint this more positively, some more negatively, but we are able to individualize our life experience more, um, you know, across a wide variety of boundaries, uh, certainly in the 90s and early 2000s at Reason, we celebrated the mass individualization and the mass personalization of culture, of lifestyle, of economic service. And, you know, and Matt Welch, my colleague and I wrote a book called The Declaration of Independence, where he said, you know, like the places where this aren't isn't happening are places like education, retirement, and, and healthcare, because they're overwhelmingly dominated by governments at various levels. But I guess my question with that Pondicio quote, where, where does common culture go in this debate? Because it seems like America is desperate for some kind of commonality, but school choice, which I certainly support exactly in the way you guys are talking about it, would lead in a different direction, more of a, a of a kind of uh, 
balkanized experience. Uh, we, Connor, do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go I'll ahead. First, go ahead. I think uh, I'll so, go we, so we don't have we don't have a we have nine out of ten kids in public schools today, and we have a extremely mm -hmm. divided uh, country today and po politically polarized yeah. country. So the, the you know there's kind of this fairy tale um, theory of of the democratic pro, uh, public schools. Yeah, that the that are public schools were the crucible. Of, yeah, I, I that, mean Milton Friedman used to talk about this, who was a product of public schools in the 1920s and 30s, and he would often talk about that. Um, and that goes back to that a kind of Americanization model, which may or may not have worked. Um, yeah, but it was I, certainly I, is not where we're at now. I don't think it works when you have a, mon a monopolistic school system. And, mm -hmm. you know, who gets to decide what that common culture is going to look like? It's typically yeah. a, a certain group. And what we've seen, how the political process works, it's usually a minority special interest inflicting their views on other people's kids. Right. And uh, we have a, a ton of evidence on this in the school choice literature as well. I did one mm -hmm. of them, a uh, peer-reviewed review of the evidence called Do Self-Interested Schooling Selections um, Improve Society or whatever I called the type, whatever mm -hmm. it was. And Patrick Wolf at University of Arkansas did one called Civics Exam and Education Next and finding, and also in my, my co-edited book with Neil McCluskey from Cato Institute, Patrick Wolf updated his, his uh, meta-analysis of this literature in one of the chapters in that book. And overwhelmingly, the studies find that private school choice in particular leads to more better civic outcomes, including tolerance of others' views, which I think is a really important one, more political participation uh, and other uh, civic outcomes as well. So the evidence doesn't bear out the theories that are laid out by the, the government school defenders. Yeah. Uh, Nick, Connor? Uh, yeah, so I, I recently had the opportunity to go uh, back to my old stomping grounds where I went to high school. I grew up in San Diego, and uh, and I went to the high school, and it was a very sad experience. What before was an open set of uh, buildings and free-flowing student body mm -hmm. was under lock and key. There were gates everywhere, cameras, metal detectors, and all mm -hmm. the rest. And, and that school is not an anomaly, especially with all the school shootings. So many people want to further turn yeah. these into prison-like institutions. So to your question about community and culture, I question whether a, a statist institution such as government schools mm -hmm. is really going to enhance our community, build community, enhance the culture, build the social fabric. I think quite the opposite. I think the state is on one end of the spectrum and true society is on the other. We need voluntary relationships and so forth to be able to rebuild that. And as a longtime homeschooling dad, I only put my kids in that micro school this past fall. We've been homeschooling them mm -hmm. for a decade. And of course, early on, we would get the critiques like you sometimes hear, oh, your kids aren't going to be socialized. They're, you know, they're not going <laughs> to be part of the community. Good. And then I look at what, how kids on, on, you know, with all the, like on, in the government schools, the bullying, the toxicity, pornography, mm -hmm. drugs, cheating, and all the rest. And I'm like, that's not how I want my kids to be socialized. Mm -hmm. When my kids are out doing field trips in the middle of the day while all their public school peers are sitting in a box in a brick and mortar cage, my kids are out there connecting with adults, shopping at businesses, going through mm -hmm. museums, connecting with other families. There's very strong community. And I think that through this kind of decentralized educational marketplace, if we can continue to grow and sustain it, we're going to have a far richer and more tightly interwoven social fabric of true community mm -hmm. than we do right now with everyone just sitting in these factory schools across the country being propagandized by leftist public school teachers. Yeah. Um, if I may, uh, I, I went to a Catholic grammar school and high school in Middletown, New Jersey. At my high school... Uh, which is an indicator of how bad it was, if, despite being you know, private Catholic, it was a parochial school, actually went out of business uh, a couple of years ago. And for me, uh, that was, uh, you know, that was a happy day to know that, you know, <laughs> children were, were no longer going to be uh, softly imprisoned in that particular space. It's another moment of kind of horseshoe theory of, uh, you know, uh, people like Michel Foucault, who I, you know, is not in good uh, standing among uh, many, uh, uh, among um, many uh, uh, right-wing school reformers, but he often likened, as did people like Thomas Saws, you know, mandatory schooling is a, a kind of minimum security prison. Um, so it's it, it's very interesting to hear you uh, discuss it in those terms, Connor, and certainly the lockdowns, uh, you know, and the intensification of kind of literal sure. gatekeeping on school. Uh, 
grounds for you know a variety of mostly overhyped but understandable concerns is kind of fascinating. I want to um, we're going to to wrap up. We're going to um, I'm going to ask you to talk about the uh, kind of direction and velocity of school choice. But before we do that, I'd like I'd like to just do a short kind of biographical moment with each of you, Corey. Um, talk a little bit about your current position and also your, uh, you have a, a PhD in um, education. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you're doing now and how you got there? Yeah, I really got into this as a researcher. I did my PhD at the University of Arkansas in their Department of Education Reform. And my first study mm -hmm. linked the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program, which mm -hmm. started in 1990. To yeah, and by the way, if I, I'm sorry to inter, uh, interrupt on that, there's a fantastic uh, couple of stories and interviews with Polly Williams, one of the uh, uh, backers of that, a state legislator in Milwaukee, who, and again, to show just this fascinating, fascinating kind of crossing of political wires, had been a member of the Black Panther Party uh, in the 60s and 70s, and then helped usher in, you know, the really the first, I believe it was the first uh, publicly funded uh, voucher program, in at least in a major city. Yeah, and we get some Democrats along with us today, too. It's not as many as we would like. Right. I mean, in Nebraska, they had three co-sponsors on their bill this year, giving us the filibuster-proof majority. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. They're about to pass their their bill for the third time. Um, uh, but, but yeah, so I, I started by looking at student-level data from the Milwaukee program with Patrick Wolf at University of Arkansas. And we found huge mm -hmm. reductions in, in the likelihood of crime. In Wisconsin, if you have first name, last name, and date of birth, you can look up anybody's criminal records, which as a libertarian, I didn't like that idea very much. But as a researcher, it was great because everybody yeah. else is looking at test scores. We're looking at really important lifelong outcomes. Right. And since then, uh, there have been six studies on the topic, all peer-reviewed. I've done two of them, finding school more school choice, uh, less crime later on in life. Um, and then, so I kind of thought about going into academia for a while. Then I started to realize that my peers in the peer review process were my enemies, not so much my friends or my peers. Um, and I, although uh, fighting that uphill battle, I've, I've published over 30 or 40 peer reviewed uh, journal articles uh, mm -hmm. in just, you know, a handful of years. Um, so I've done a lot of work in, in, in the academic space. But then also I started to realize that I'm spending all this time writing 50, 60 page articles and nobody's really reading them. Some of them, you make a big splash with like the crime study and people uh, want to learn about that. But um, I started to figure out I could have more of an impact uh, mm -hmm. in other ways. And so I start, went through the think tank route where I had my first think tank role was at the Cato Institute, where I'd be mm -hmm. rewarded for my ide ideas as opposed to being punished in the university system where, uh, you know, people didn't like. The yeah. I had one peer reviewer on that that uh, Milwaukee study, for example, saying that I, I believe it's causal. I, 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 I get it with the, the methods are legit. But why are you asking this question? You are right. problematizing the situation by saying that even asking that school choice could reduce crime. So it's just a, it was yeah. a total disaster. And so now I'm at the American Federation for Children. I'm a senior fellow. I do a lot of communications work, but I do still I, I do studies from time to time as well. Uh, my most recent one being during the pandemic period with Christos McCready's, we found that places mm -hmm. that had stronger teachers unions we're more likely to keep the schools closed longer. For, for us, that was kind of a no-brainer right. finding, but it was good to put it down on paper and write about it. All right. And of course, you did a stint at uh, Reason Foundation as well. Yep. Um, but um, thank you for that. And Connor, uh, talk a little bit about the Libertas Institute as well as the Tuttle Twin series. So I come from more of an activist background. Um, I hated school and uh, it took me a while to learn to love learning. And once I did, I started you know, binge reading and, and uh, self-teaching a lot of what I now do. Um, started Libertas Institute in 2011 as a state-based think tank in Utah, my new adopted state. Since then, we've expanded our work uh, across the country uh, to work on uh, policies and uh, gosh, two dozen plus states uh, so far. Uh, we've changed over 100 laws on a wide range of uh, topics, civil forfeiture, drug policy, property rights, criminal justice reform, education policy, and more. Um, so we're more kind of the less of a think tank, perhaps a traditional think tank, yeah. more of a do tank. I was uh, hoping we, you wouldn't say that. That's one of, you know, that's kind of like... Uh... <laughs> 
a trigger for me. The do tank <laughs> versus the think tank. I uh, even hate that term. I'm trying it. to come up with a better term for a it. Go but... tank. I don't know. Drunk tank. My, my, whatever. My point was yeah. that while Corey yeah. and others can dig in and do the research, we'll leverage and work with people yeah. like that, and then we'll we'll be kind of the boots on the ground and go work with elected officials. Right. Um, along the way, I've got a couple of kids, and they started asking me what I do for work all day, and I struggled mm -hmm. to know how to teach them or talk to them about these ideas that uh, literally went on Amazon trying to find like books that talk about free markets or property rights. There was nothing. So with my partner, Elijah, who's our illustrator, uh, we launched the Tuttle Twins in 2014. We've now sold 5 million copies of these books that teach the rising generation about things like individualism, free markets, property rights, and the ideas of, of human flourishing. So I'm, I'm because I had such a poor schooling experience and as a father, uh, education is a huge uh, issue and focus for us because mm -hmm. I feel like we're not going to save our country at the Capitol. We're not going to save our country at the courtroom. We're going to save our country at the dinner table with families learning and talking and, and debating some of these ideas together, rebuilding the community and the social fabric that we're talking about. That's how we save our country, not the government, not the nation, but, but our country as a people and as a community. So I, I dedicate a lot of my time to try and raise the warning voice. Corey and I are in particular with this book, but then also offer up solutions and help families uh, learn about the ideas of freedom. Um, what uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about what what was it like homeschooling kids? Because, um, you know, that's you know, that's a it's a, a lot of time to spend with your kids for them to spend with you and you're working and things like that. Just, you know, kind of what was the emotional experience or the day-to-day -day experience of that? Um, well, I, I think it was, it is a, a, an investment of time. It is a sacrifice. Uh, typically works best in a two-parent household where you can juggle schedules or if you have a stay-at-home uh, uh, mom type of situation. But what we are huge fans of and what are exploding across the country are homeschool co-ops. Effectively, they're kind of micro schools, but rather than a, a teacher or a few teachers who are being paid, it's the parents coming together. So, for example, I did classes for the teens on public speaking, persuasive mm -hmm. writing, uh, history, critical thinking and, and other topics as mm -hmm. well. You might have a mom who was a biology major in college who can do a little science class for the mm -hmm. kids. And so parents, again, community mm -hmm. coming together to pool their resources and their knowledge and then educate you know, dozens mm -hmm. of kids all at the same time. Uh, those are exploding all over the place. They create great bonding opportunities for the parents, especially mm -hmm. the moms where they can go do, you know, mom's nights out and social mm -hmm. events and so forth. Um, and so that is kind of homeschooling 2.0. It's the traditional sit at home and your kids mm -hmm. are just, you know, being taught by mom. Now it's getting out with other families, uh, mm -hmm. going to the park, uh, playing together, learning together. And that, I think, uh, provides the social element, provides the peer mm -hmm. element, but then you get exposure not just to mom or dad teaching you, but to a variety of adults. And so that that's something we leaned into heavily, and a lot of families across the country who homeschool are doing co-ops right now as well. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, uh, just to kind of wrap up, uh, uh, Corey, why don't we start with you? Can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, what do you, you know what's the what's the direction of school choice what what is happening now that is uh, most exciting to you and uh, you know when when are we going to see a change that is uh, you know that gets us out of ninety percent nine out of ten kids going to uh, public schools. Yes, uh, school choice has reached escape velocity. We're seeing a universal school choice revolution that is ignited right before our eyes, mostly in red states right now, uh, but we're freeing families from the clutches of Randy Weingarten and the teachers unions once and for all, and there's not a dang thing that they can do about it. I think from what I see, what, what I see going forward is more of the red state domino dominoes will fall. We've had six go all in in just two years, uh, Arkansas, um, Arizona, West Virginia, Iowa, Utah, and most recently Florida. That's over 10% mm -hmm. of states going all in, which means all families eligible, uh, where, whereas previous proposals yep. have been more incremental um, victories. And, and when you say I, all in, explain yep. what that means. Like I, in I, Iowa, I mean, all, what does that mean? All families eligible, being able to take their right. kids' state-funded education dollars to the public, private charter, or home-based education option of, of their choosing. So that's a, yep. that's a lot of momentum in a very short amount of time, and I don't think it's mm -hmm. going to stop 
and we're seeing a lot of red state competition. So there's Nebraska that's passed, uh, that's still moving the ball down the field. We have mm -hmm. uh, Texas, uh, where I live now. Uh, their Senate passed a bill that's kind of moving through the House right now, and the governor's pushing it harder than I've ever seen before. So mm -hmm. I think once more red states fall, some blue states are going to have to come along as well. Democrats, if they keep opposing parental rights and education, they're either going to lose their elections or they're going to start to read the tea leaves and say, maybe we should support this too. And I think the more that the GOP leans into parental rights as a political winner in the short run, mm -hmm. the more that in the long run will become a bipartisan issue. And we're seeing some trickles of this happening already mm -hmm. that and look, Milton Friedman said it best that it's not about putting the right people into office. It's, it's about creating a climate of public opinion where it becomes politically profitable for the wrong people to do the right thing. And we're seeing some Democrat defections. Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania, right before the mm -hmm. election, he was up double digits in the polls, but he still felt compelled to put education savings account accounts in his education plan right before the election. J.B. Mm -hmm. Pritzker in Illinois, a similar situation. He was up by a lot. Um, right, right before the election, he mm -hmm. responded to a candidate survey supporting a private school choice program out there that he had previously vowed to get rid of mm -hmm. back in 2017 and 2018. So we're seeing them either reading the tea leaves or perhaps some Democrats are having a true change of heart, which yeah. I, I wish that would be the case, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, whatever the reason right. is, uh, that it's going to be good news for, for parents going forward. And, uh, Perhaps we'll have some victories in blue states too. Yeah, Connor, what about you? What what's most exciting to you uh, in terms of school choice? Um, I'll, I'll answer with a brief story. Right after we conclude here, I'm going to be picking up my phone and ordering lunch using DoorDash. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get uh, what I want, how I want it, when I want it, and where I want it. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, then, what most excites me is the individualism that we're going to see flourish as a result of this kind of changing world that we're in. I think individualism like DoorDash, Uber Eats, Uber and Lyft, right, rather than going to have to wait on a bus's schedule and sit there at the bus station and then get on the bus and have to stop along the way, hey, I can have an Uber pick me up where I want and take me to where I want to go. And um, I think that becomes very addicting for people who get used to doing things their own way we start to increasingly question a system that requires us to conform to it. Uh, and that's, that's the downside of the modern education system. The government schools require kids to conform to it rather than being flexible and adapting to the differing uh, desires and circumstances of, of kids. So especially as the economy increasingly moves in a more individualized, customized direction, I think that's going to have a huge trickle down benefit to parental styles and approaches and education, especially as we see micro schools and these other systems flourish in part, uh, incentivized by the laws that Corey and I have been uh, talking about and pushing for. So I, I, and as a libertarian, I love that too, because I think that has kind of fringe benefits of helping people understand at a more conceptual level that the economic aspects or the educational aspects of individualism have political ramifications as well. So. I think directionally, that that's what most excites me right now. Is there anything, uh, Connor, that um, you know? What what is the thing that will derail school choice? If if you've got momentum, uh, you know the the Uber eats the Lyft cars. They're leaving the station. They're going to pick up people. What I don't I don't want to say the train is leaving the station because the train is a centralized conveyance which runs on its own schedule. So, uh, what might derail this, if anything? The thing that worries me, having just gotten an ESA law passed in our state, what keeps me up at night and, and what I think it will could derail this is uh, low demand. In other words, we have a lot of paper successes right now. We've, you know, Utah and half a dozen other states so far have, have passed ESA laws. Great, right? Those exist on paper. Um, now it's time to show there's actually parental demand. Now it's time to attract the attention um, of many of these families. And so as these programs come online, as they have been in Arizona, West Virginia, and mm -hmm. others, 
Um, I think the narrative is very important, especially given the historical dominance of the teachers unions and others and the attacks on school choice. Mm -hmm. we, we need a strong narrative. We need a strong kind of moral high ground and an army of people saying, we want this, we love it, we're going to defend it. And if we don't have that army, if our opponents can look and say, oh, look, all of that money and all that effort for, you know, 10,000 families, big whoop. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm most worried about... Uh, you know the paper success. Not how do you how do, how do how do you how do you uh, grow that demand? How do you or how do you is it advertising? Is it marketing? Uh, what, you know what what do you do to increase that demand? Um, you know I think a lot of it is word of mouth when uh, moms and Facebook groups are saying, "Oh my gosh, I just got eight thousand bucks for my kids to go to this awesome new micro school that opened up." Mm -hmm. I think that uh, has a strong component. What we're planning on, for example, throughout the summer and fall uh, in our state is a lot of kind of town halls, especially in lower income communities, handing out leaflets saying, hey, come learn how your kids can go to a high quality private school, online ads, and really just trying to build the, the email list in the community so that when the program launches, we've got a ton of people waiting at the gate to say, hey, let me in, I want to apply. And then that will create its own trickle down narrative with earned media attention and others to say, oh, wow, like the computer crashed. I mean, I think in Arizona, Corey would yeah. know, but yeah, they, they launched from... their computers crash, yeah. right? Yeah. They Corey, went... what, what about you? What is, uh, finish that story. And then what, what are you worried about in terms of? Yeah, morale? they went from 10,000 people using the program last year to right when they opened the floodgates and went fully universal. They, they now have over 51,000 people signed up in just, mm -hmm. you know, less than a year. And that's so... students or households or what? That's uh, students, and so I okay. believe that's almost five percent of the the, the uh, school age population in Arizona. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a pretty significant shift in a short amount of time, and that the program opened up, the expansion opened up to everybody after the school year started uh, mm -hmm. last year. So if it was if it was timed out better, I would expect there would be even yep. more people that would have signed up. Um, so I, th I think Connor's right. Getting people signed up for the program is important. I'm more, and you know, I don't really care. Like if, if, if everybody is eligible and um, you know, not everybody signs up, I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't have like a goal as to how many people should sign up, but there is a benefit to signing people up and that you create a new voting block for when uh, if, 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 if someone in power tries to take that away, well, if there's no one using the program yet, it's easier for them no. to take away. But if you have a new constituency, it's really hard for them to um, to come out and rip those scholarships out of the hands of, of parents. So mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a huge benefit. And then as far as derailing, I don't think there's any derailing. There's going to be forces that try to derail it. The teachers unions are going to try to do it. Um, but the more that we keep knocking down the dominoes and more people start to use it and we can show that this doesn't destroy the public schools that the, the fear-mongering will will go have to go away they'll still try they'll still try to make that case that this will you know if we do it here i know it didn't happen in these other states it's going to destroy our public schools for x y or z reason yep. it's going to become less and less of a compelling narrative um and so yeah i i don't see any real threats um i'm very confident that we'll continue to win and one of the reasons i'm super confident is that school choice it's always been the logical winner it is now a political winner too mm -hmm. and um in afc's uh 76 of the candidates that were supported by afc and our affiliates mm -hmm. won their races in 22 2022 so there wasn't a red wave or a blue wave but there was a school choice wave and i mm -hmm. think that's going to continue because this is ultimately a battle about parental rights and um, the side who wants to say that I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach, the side that's going to say that the kids and the money meant for educating them belong to the government schools, they're going to ultimately lose because parents, they want the most the most safe for their own children. They, mm -hmm. They're in the best position to make those decisions for their kids. And so I think we continue this momentum um, despite the best efforts of the unions. And there will be some people fear-mongering uh, from the right too. And we've, we've yeah. seen some of that recently, but I don't think anyone really takes them seriously. And um, the, the bills have taken their considerations seriously by putting in explicit provisions against regulations, against um, government control of, of private education. Um, mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, when you weigh all the costs and benefits, most people are going to see that school choice is an incremental step in the right direction.
Well, I hope you're right. Uh, you know, the big loser, of course, will be, uh, you know, all of the uh, people who write novels, movies, make record albums like Pink Floyd's The Wall. You know, what What will we do when we no longer have, you know, a warehouse of awful memories from K through 12 education uh, to produce content about? Um, it's... Uh, you know, it'll it'll be a sad day, I suppose, uh, but one that I'm looking forward to. I want to thank uh, my guest today, uh, Corey DeAngelis and Connor Boyack, the authors most recently of Mediocrity, 40 Ways Government Schools Are Failing Today's Students. Uh, check out, you, you'll find links to everything they do in the show notes and things like that. But uh, Corey, Connor, thanks so much for talking to Reason. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And, okay, I'm um, in...